I'm a very private person, as we discussed before. This is very uncomfortable for me. This is me paying back. James, how did you find Carnival? Well, this is a very long story. It goes back to my birth. Uh, first year of my life, I was starved for whatever reason. My mother was feeding me formula and mixed it at half strength. So I was this terrible baby that had all these problems, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And it turns out I was being starved for a year. So that was the first step to my food issues. Uh, when I was five, my parents separated. When I was eight, they divorced, and we fell into abject poverty. My mother refused to get a regular job, decided she wanted to go back to college with no money and no job and no, no income. So for six years, we literally starved, and I mean literally starved. We would take, uh, go to the local grocery store and take the, the little dog food samples and eat those. Um, so um, So my response to food was broken at that time. Um, fat kid in, in their, in the fifties, which, you know, is very unusual, but, um, um, uh, when I got a job, finally got a job at 16, fell into real serious binge eating, weighed, you know, 230 when I left to go to college in 1968. Um, college didn't work out for me after a couple of years was, I wasn't dealing with anything really well at that point. Got married, um, went into the, the very popular at the time, the homesteading type lifestyle. Did that for almost 20 years. Uh, for, for those In those 20 years, I lost 100 pounds seven times. The lowest I ever got was 195. Um, and just lost the weight and then immediately gained it back. You know, like I said, my, my, what, my joke used to be I'm visiting this particular weight. Because as soon as I stalled, it fell apart. Uh, marriage broke up in 89. I got involved with someone else. In 92, I did my eighth 100-pound drop and visited 215 pounds for about five minutes. That marriage broke up, and I moved into the Detroit area when, for my, where I was working. And I was in serious physical trouble. Um, my weight had got up to 382. I was having what I believe at this time was severe blood sugar reactions, um, all kinds of uh, stuff that I don't even remember this, these days. But I saw I saw Gary Tarb's article. I was in the New York Times, and then I saw um, uh, his first book, "Good Calories, Bad Calories." And on May second, twenty uh, two thousand two, I went full keto. Worked well for the time, lost 110 pounds, got got immensely healthier, um, but and actually maintained that for a few years. But we all know you and I have the same issue of being abstainers, and we all know that keto is a trap. Um, one of the things I say was, yeah, they say add half a sweet potato, and if I did that within two weeks, I had a whole fryer full of sweet potato fries. You know, it's just, and uh, this went on and uh, my health issues got worse. In 2019, I went, I had a knee replacement and they found all these issues, heart issues, uh, you know, prediabetes, um, extremely high blood pressure, all this, and, and the usual shovels full of medications. And I continued to gain weight. And by the middle of 2022, I was back up to 355. And I thought I was dying. Uh, actually, I probably was. Um, an old friend of mine, I was talking to him and uh, uh, about two, two months ago. And there was a guy who had come into his shop and he had all of the serious, he had diabetes, he was on Ozempic type drugs, he was on insulin, he was just had this terrible health problem, didn't know what to do. So I was talking to him. I get real enthusiastic these days. I, I was talking to him about how. Uh, all the things he could do and how he could heal this. And my friend Tom steps in. And he says, yeah, a, a, a year and a half ago, Dave was was dying. He couldn't come in here and walk across the room. Uh, he, he'd run out of breath walking across the room. I figured he was gone. And I knew that I was sick, but I didn't know that I was so bad that other people around me were noticing. So I, well, due to the, due to the starvation raising my and my siblings are kind of fetishistic about 
saving food and having food in the house put away. So after after the middle of the year, um, I realized that most of my food preps were old and getting out of date. So I got really involved in doing the food preps to the point where I was missing meals and I wasn't all this stuff. I was very, very involved. In I had no energy. I had no strength. I had no stamina. So it was a great deal of effort to do, and I just didn't have time to eat with it. So long about March of 2023, I realized that I probably lost some weight. So I got a scale, and yeah, I'd lost 30 pounds. So I said, well, this gives me a chance. I got to do something. So I started to look, and I knew keto uh, had some help, but it, wouldn't, it wasn't enough. I knew it, it didn't work for me. I've been doing it for 20 years. Now, in all honesty, I never cheated on keto. I never had grains. I never had sugar. Um, but it, you know, I still had all the issues. So I went on carnivore and that's kind of the end of the story. I've been on it for almost a year now. Um, depending on where you, whether you take it from when I took my weight in March or whether you took it, take it when I went to, took my weight in middle of 2022, I'm either down, um, a little over hundred pounds or over a little over 130. Uh, the amount of healing I have had is unbelievable to the point where I'm still, there's one where I'm still shocked. And that is this. Uh, my father's family is Native American. All of them die young from heart problems. I had some severe cardiac issues diagnosed in 2019. I asked, is there any cure for this? And the cardiologist said, absolutely not. You have to manage it, but there's nothing we can do. There's nothing anybody can do. So in January of this year, I went and got another echocardiogram. I also got a CIMT, which said that my carotid arteries are completely clear, no, no blockages, which is a good thing. And it looked to me in my untrained eye like, well, it kind of looks like I had some improvement. Like it's not, the, not what it was. So on February 20th, I went to see my cardiologist. And of course, you saw a nurse practitioner because nobody sees the actual doctors anymore. They're far too busy to actually see patients. And I said to her, um, now I'm not a doctor, but this looks to me like I've had some improvement by these numbers. And she said, well, not really. What's really happened is you're completely healed. You're normal. So the uh, enlarged heart isn't a problem. The um, left ventricle that was all knotted up and not pumping at all properly. And, my, and so my whole system wasn't pumping properly. That's all fine. The only thing I have, I have a slight stiffness on one part of the wall, my left ventricle. And when you grow up with the idea that you are inherited heart disease and you're going to die young, and then you find out you do have it, then all of a sudden, the blue somebody says, "Oh, by the way, it's all gone. You're healed. You're normal. You're going to live a long time." That's like getting hit with a head, head with a hammer. I just, I'm a talker. I'm a storyteller, and I didn't know what to say. I spent days not telling people this happened and I just don't know what to say about it. It's just amazing to me. Now, of course, I had the usual stuff. I had, at one point I was diagnosed with stage three kidney disease, partly because I think of the tons of medications I was taking. And since I worked in dialysis for 26 years, that's a frightening thing. Uh, and I had quote unquote prediabetes, which we all know means diabetes. They just don't call it that at that point. Um, Two months after I started carnivore, my creatinine was down to 123 and 128 is the normal level. So no, no kidney disease. And it's continued to fall ever since. It was 118 in November. So it goes down a little bit every few months. Uh, the um, diabetes is the, in the last uh, uh, test was 5.4, the A1C. Uh, fasting insulin was three last time I had it checked. My resting glucose is 70, which is, you know, low normal. So I'm healed. And to, to answer a question you'll probably want to ask later, this is my why. I have no reason to do anything different. And I don't cheat. I don't know, understand these people who have cheat days and stuff. I don't cheat. The closest thing I come to cheating is... If I like chicken, if I ate chicken more than three days in a row, some of my arthritis starts to come back. So the, some of the pain, joint pain comes back. So if I ate it one day, pork doesn't seem to bother me. I quit dairy almost immediately based on uh, recommendations of other people just not to take the chance. So I haven't done any dairy at all. 
But the secondary um, healing, I mean, we can go over that. Uh, I had psoriasis at the top of my head for 12 years. That's gone. Floaters in my eyes are gone. Um, bleeding gums are gone. Um, I've I've had always had so much tartar. They've had me do three uh, dental visits a, a year. They just cut that back to two because I'm not getting that much, much uh, tartar anymore. Uh, all my joint pain is gone. My right knee is destroyed, but it doesn't hurt to walk. Um, I had a I damaged my back severely in 1960. I don't remember what year, but it's been 61 years, so that would be 1962. Went down a set of cement stairs on my back after a rainstorm. So all my life I've had severe back problems to the point where I did a DEXA scan here just recently, bone scan, and they told me that my lower back is so screwed up they couldn't even look at that and take a, a, a bone scan data off of it. But that doesn't, you know, and, and of course there's a lot of times where I was laid up and I've always I've done physical work and just wasn't able to work some day, sometimes, you know, I had to take months off different times and I, it doesn't hurt. Um, I had rheumatoid arthritis in my left hand so bad it blew up like a balloon at times. Haven't had one incident of it since. I had real bad carpal tunnel in both hands. Um, that doesn't hurt. The only pain I get in my hand is if I overuse my, my right thumb, I destroyed a joint when I was like 21. I hit the end of my thumb extremely hard on a very hard object, and the the one joint is is not good. So if I overuse it lifting heavy stuff, I'll get some pain there. Um, in all honesty, I have a cardiac issue that can't be that hasn't been healed. But that is what they call a left left bundle block problem, where you have you the the signals come in from, to both sides of your heart alternately. But one pathway is closed, so both signals have to come off the come through the one side, so the the, the timing's a little off uh, for the second stroke. And apparently, that's not all that unusual. It's you know a number of people have it; they don't know why. There's anything they can do about it. So I don't I don't worry about it. The first the first question I've got is just to go back. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you you actually heard about carnivore? Like I know you'd been keto for for it, a time, but when when did you first hear about it? And when you first heard about it, what did you think? You like was this? Well, it was it was in March. Or? I was I was looking for a solution, something that I could do that would work, that wasn't keto. Because I I've twenty years of learning keto don't work. You know I can't eat, I can't moderate. I'm a binge mm. eater. I'm a carb addict. And all of the things that I described you have in my childhood, you know, I have various things that are broken. I don't have sat a satiety. My satiety is broken. My appetite is broken. I mean, I can't, I don't have normal reactions to those things. So I needed something that was strict, that was very easy to follow, and had no chance of me getting into the carbohydrates. So in March, I started to look. And I came across a number of people. Um, there are, you know, all the standard ones. And some of who I've taken and discarded over time is not meeting my needs. Um, and then uh, one guy that doesn't get enough credit, I don't think, is a guy called Dr. Stan Eckberg. He's a, I don't know if he's a, a chiropractor or, an, or, a, or a naturopath or whatever he is. But I really liked his explanations. He gets real slow and real basic, and it'll take a half hour to explain a concept. And when you're starting out, that's really important. At least for somebody like me, I'm, I'm very science-oriented, very detail-oriented, very engineering-oriented, and I need to know the why. How does it work? Why does it work? And I need it explained to me, and I've always appreciated uh, his videos. Now, I've gotten to the point now where I don't need them. He, he's, he's, it's a uh, more of a beginner's thing, but I'll, you know, I'll always respect the guy for that. Now, the other issue with me, I don't lose weight on carnivore. I lose weight on fasting. I fast, I, I, I started out, I was fasting, doing alternate day and two days and three days and that kind of stuff, and I would lose weight there. And I lost four pounds in April and 12 pounds in May and 10 pounds in June and nine pounds in July. And due to relentless propaganda from some sites about fasting and, you know, eating carnivore every day, 
in August, I went on, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat carnivore every day. And by October, my weight had gone up a little bit because I had fasted right up till the time I started. And I have noticed that I get a, a fasting rebound. Some of it's fluid. And I think some, according to what I read, some of it might be muscle tissue because all the human growth, growth hormone you get during fasting, if you eat a uh, a lot of uh, heavy protein meal right afterwards. The human growth protein is still there and you will put on maybe a pound or two of, of muscle. And I think that's probably true. Um, but anyway, so then in November, I started heavy duty fasting. In November, I did a 14 and a 10. Lost almost 25 pounds. In December, I noodled around and did some short-term fasting and some eating and I lost maybe three, four pounds. I did 21 days in January and lost another 25 pounds. And I did 16 days in February and lost about 20 pounds. Um, I had surgery the end of July, end of, end of January, and really loaded up on the fluid, uh, which, I, which I kind of expected, you know, you're really traumatizing your body and all that. But I was down to about 220. Uh, when I said stop now, I actually back up about 10, 15 pounds because I then went almost two weeks eating every day. And but I'm I'm right now I'm wearing the same clothes that I was wearing at 220. So I really have not gained inches. I have not put in my belly's not bigger. My you know uh, my I'm wearing the smaller clothes. So I'm assuming that maybe my body decided to put on some muscle. And part of the reason for that is back in 2002, when I got down to 270, I was wearing a certain size clothes. Well, this time around, I had to get down to below 230 to wear those same clothes, which tells me that my body's less dense and I'm a lot, I'm a, a lot fatter. And even at this, even at the 220, I'm carrying enough of a belly to be considered obese. So, I mean, it comes back to the whole, the whole N equals one thing for experimentation. We're all different. And truly, there aren't good scientific answers for why things happen to us. I found another guy that had that same issue. We ate regularly and he put on 30 pounds, but it wasn't fat, you know, after he'd lost a lot of weight. And uh, so I don't have any answers. I'm just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay carnivore. Um, I've eaten the last couple days. I'm going to go back on a fast here another day or two, another long fast and see what happens. Uh, but this is all I got. This is what I, this is all I have to do. I'm 73 years old. This is the last chance. And at 73, I'm getting, I'm getting improvements that I never thought I would get. And I, that's what made me, made me the preacher in this. Mm. Is everybody I talk to, I do my best to go, listen, I don't care how old you are. I don't care about anything. You can do this. Um, I'm, very, I, I'm a very private person, as we discussed before. This is very uncomfortable for me. This is me paying back. The other day, I, I'm, like I said, I'm very active in the comments, and, guy, and I had described my heart situation. And this guy wrote to me and said, well, I'm 70. I have some of the similar heart conditions. Uh, if I go on keto, can this help? And I just wrote back and said, well, sir, um, I was keto for 20 years. All the time I was getting this damage. So I, don't, I would not recommend that. Those of us who need to heal have to quit all of the carbohydrates, and that's all of them. At least that's my experience. Am I an expert, yeah. Elder? So regarding the, those improvements that you've had, when did you, after you started doing carnivore, um, at what point did you start to realize something's improving? Well, now the thing like the kidney disease and the diabetes, I was getting blood work and things were dropping. I mean, the first the first draw on the on the, di on the 
uh, for diabetes was 5.7 A1C. The second was 5.6. And the last one was, not, was November and 5.4. And it's probably lower now. All these things trend, are trending down very slowly. And I said the creatinine in, in, in May, which was the first time I had labs taken after starting carnivore, it was, it was finally below the 1.28. Because prior to that, even though it wasn't at the peak it was, it was still high. It was still listed in my diagnosis of the kidney, kidney disease. And at, so then it was 1.23. And then it was, you know, um, I think it was 1.18 and then 1.13 in November, if I remember correctly. I'd have to look it up. So that's what happened. And it's just, I tell people all the time. I'm very scientific organ. I worked in medicine for 26 years. And in truth, if someone came up to me and I didn't hadn't experienced this and told me my story, I'd be going, yeah, bullshit. And I understand why people wouldn't listen to me because it's not anything we are taught. We're told these conditions are permanent and incurable and you can't do anything about them. And you have to take seven to 10 to 15 to 20 medications. Well, let me tell you, my blood pressure meds, I'm down to one. I'm taking an infant dose of one particular medication that my PCP wants me to take because she says it's protective of my kidneys and I did have kidney disease. Not that I need it for the blood pressure. And then there's another interesting story where they just, they, uh, I was having AFib when they, when they did the surgery, when they started doing the surgery in that time. Well, I'm not convinced I had AFib because they were dosing me so heavily with diuretics, uh, you know, uh, for the blood pressure because that's what I was starch on. That's when, and I didn't really start having it until I had the the uh, uh, was taking the, the blood pressure meds. Well, the 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 uh, one drug that they had me for the taken for the the drug they had me taken for the uh, uh, AFib. Um, it's expensive, but my insurance covers it. And they also, and it, they also said, well, um, we have to bring you, we have to put you in the hospital and test you every four hours because it can kill you. <laughs> well, that's encouraging. <laughs> anyway, so they went to, they, they tested my, my electrolytes and all that, which they had to do for giving me this drug. And my potassium was so low, they put me on an immediate potassium IV. Very low potassium will give you AFib. Well, they got my potassium back up. At the same time, they put me on this med. And in five years, I haven't had any AFib. But it doesn't mean that the drug's doing anything, except possibly killing me. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, they had me taking this real strong blood thinner, which I work with my hands a lot, and I'm not the most dexterous person so i tend to bleed a lot and oh man when you cut yourself good and then you have to put a pressure on it for almost an hour to get to quit bleeding that's really annoying but you know oh well, you could die of a blood clot yeah i could and you know my my triglycerides i haven't had them checked in quite a while but they were down to a normal level my a my a1 my uh, hdl was up Somewhere around 50, you know, uh, my I had my testosterone checked and it's up way above where it was, um, you know, all these different things. But my LDL is 260, 240, something like that. So, of course, you know, every excuse you get, well, you need to get on a stat. And I I sent this t the, my PCP six studies, which I'm sure she never bothered to read and said, I am never taking a statin. Because as we all know, the, the latest mega studies, especially from some ones from Scandinavia show, higher your LDL is, lower your chance of diabetes and stroke and early death and all this stuff, you know. Now, I have a sister who has pretty severe diabetes. And even with what I'm doing, you can't, te you can't teach anybody anything. Because... Uh, she's doing the Wagovi and listening to her doctor and, you know, has ulcers on her feet and neuropathy. And, you know, well, they got her A1C down from 
from almost eight to seven point seven or some bullshit like that. You know, it's just yeah. oh, if you have to take the bullshit out, that's fine. Um, but <laughs> I'm Australian. You can't offend me with language. I, I'm interested in um, the the eating versus fasting. So when you are eating, what what are the meals made up of? And then well, what what is the signal that you get to go, you know, I, I I need to fast for a while now? Well, it's I do it because I think, you know, fasting is really easy. I'm very fat adapted. I'm heavy, uh, a lot of fat to burn. And I've heard you say agree that the first that 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 36 hours in you feel wonderful. Well, after about three days. The hunger goes away, and it's really pretty easy. Now, I was fasted for four days from a week ago Sunday until I got to Thursday, and I started feeling not not good. I don't know any way to put it, but I was not feeling well. I was not. I was feeling like you like you people would tell you if you were fasting. And I tried the salted water with iodine and all that stuff, and I just couldn't get any better. So I said, well, I'm going to have to eat something. So I ate, and I eat, I eat a lot of canned fish now. That's the first thing I eat. So I eat a lot of canned fish now. I had some sardines and herring. And boy, my body said, yep, that's what I wanted. I went back and did another four days, no problem. And then uh, there's this Filipino guy. Well, he's, he's an American, but he's a Filipino descent, who doesn't do um, any low carb at all. But what he does do, he does four day fast, 96 hour fast, and then has an eating window where he's five to 7,000 calories. And he's dropped 70 pounds in 18 weeks. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll try that for a little bit. My body didn't like me going more than four days. I'll do four days. So I did four days, and then I've eaten the last two days. Now, as far as what I eat today, I had uh, sardines this morning, and I had uh, a little bit of. Uh, uh, salami and i had some eggs and then i bought uh spare ribs i've never cooked them before and the first time i cooked them i really screwed them up so this time i actually did a little better with them and i ate oh I, you know maybe a couple pounds of those but then you're pulling a lot of bones and stuff so i don't know how much meat that was and i said okay that's enough i stopped but it's not like i really get a you know like anthony chafee talks about you the signal where it doesn't taste as good i don't really get that that doesn't happen to me, you know, because it's all broken for me. So I have to be pay attention and look at, you know, if I'm eating, and we know that this is a terrible measure. If I'm eating somewhere approximately 3,500 calories, I go, okay, that's probably enough. It's just like any other binging. I have, I have carbonated water, and about a week ago, I started drinking it, and I binged on it so much that I got my fluid overloaded, and I started getting... Uh, swelling in my legs, you know, and kind of stuff, and I had to really back off. It took a couple, three days for that to clear. It's just that's broken in me, Dave. I can't, I can't not binge. Just because I'm always that starved little kid in the back of my head. Um, there's a story that I really related to. My first wife, when we had the farm, was going to a little country church. Because she wanted to go to church. I didn't go. I'm not a church person, but she went. Anyway, there was this married couple, a husband and wife. He was uh, American, she w and she was of Filipino descent and become a citizen. And she wanted to adopt poor kids from her family, so they adopted a boy and a, a brother and sister from an orphanage in, in, the, in the Philippines. And it took them a long time to break these kids of this habit. What they would do was during dinner, they would sneak food into their clothing, go upstairs and hide it in the bedrooms because you never knew if there was going to be food for tomorrow. That's how poor the orphanage was. That's how that's. And so so they starved. So I relate to that so well. I can't tell you how many times. We went to school in the morning and knew. There was no food in the house and no money. And you thought about that all day. And you got home and sometimes there was something and sometimes there wasn't. 
what really saved our lives was a teacher got us put us on, got us put on the free lunch program at school, so we actually got one decent meal a day. After that happened, that we were, that was after us starving for several years, and that's because my mother would not bother to ask for any of that. Um, and my brother overheard two teachers uh, uh, talking, and they said, "Yeah, those are family name kids. They actually look uh, better now than they did because we actually had some nutrition." You know, I'm I'm shorter than most of the people, uh, most of my relatives on my father's side, and I'm my brother is not. But my brother, I really hated him and envied him at the time. But he he finagled his way into getting a uh, we had a rich, very well off aunt and uncle, who I I say rich from my perspective. Then they were rich from my perspective. Now they were upper middle class. But anyway, he played on the he he played on the the heartstrings of the aunt, and she's decided to adopt him as a child. So along about twelve, he actually went, and his comment to me was, "I'm going where there's food every day." Wow. The psychological damage we take as children, it never leaves us. I have a friend. Uh, Someone I worked with who I still talk to on occasion. And uh, things happened in her childhood and even at her age, she still struggles with it. And objectively, some people might not say it was not that bad because it was psychological, not physical. But still, you know, these things wreck your life. Yeah, it, it never leaves, right? No, and yeah. it'll never leave me. And it's I've made an accommodation with it. And I have, oh, and I have a, I have a psychological story for you too. Uh, as will not be surprising. I have suffered all my life from depression around the holidays, November, December, I've always been hell. Some years worse than others. 2022 was really bad. You know, you get the black voices whispering in your ear kind of thing. Not actual voices, but the negative feelings. And this year I didn't have it. If I ate for four or five days a row, and which is why I started the long fast in November and then did the shorter fast in December, you could start to feel it. You'd start to feel the negative feelings coming back. But if I went on a fast for even three or four days, it wiped it all out. This was the best November and December I had in terms of psychology ever. Wow. So Chris Palmer says that it cures schizophrenia and bipolar, and Georgia Eads says it. Yeah, it makes a big difference. It changes things. Pretty bad when you think, you know, of everything we have to deal with psychologically and physically as humans, and then we're also busy pumping poison into our bodies all our lives to make it worse, right? Well, you know, this friend that I told you about, I was, we don't really talk. We don't, I haven't seen her in years and we primarily contribute kind of, you know, just talk back and forth through email. Um, and uh, I sent her an email and she wrote me to her back and said, this is the first time I've ever heard you describe yourself as happy. And that was during December. I don't know without carnivore if I'd be even able to be able to do this now. But I am calmed out. My sleep is better. It used to be to sleep. I would have to, I would lay there for a long time and have to con build these elaborate stories in my head. You know, write 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 whole books in my head. Just to distract myself enough to fall asleep. And now yeah, five, ten minutes I'm out. Now, I don't sleep through the night. Um, and of course, especially when I'm fasting, five, six hours, I'm done. Now, I might be in 73, I might nap, you know, in, in the afternoon, especially if I eat something. But uh, I'm, I'm awake, I'm alert. And projects, I've always been a bad procrastinator. I'm actually working on some of the projects around the house I need to do. 
And I don't have the huge reservoir of energy that some people describe, but I do have this drive to do things. I even, you know, I can only sit for so long and I have to go do something, which is unusual for me. Well, one thing I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. um, just want to go back and when we talk about the difference or, or maybe the um, effects or reasoning behind carnivore versus fasting, um, predominantly you're using the fasting. And we just talked about a few different benefits there, but predominantly you've been using the fasting for the weight loss side. No, not kind of really. uh, No. Okay. Could no, you just clarify again, that a little bit? Again, there's all kinds of stuff we haven't gotten into. No, I believe very strongly in autophagy. Mm. You know, you're through autophagy, 72 hour fast. I'm getting all the stem cells I need. I cut, I'm, stupidly was not wearing my kevlar glove slicing meat and i hacked a huge cut i mean really deep to where i couldn't even close it up in my thumb and of course that bled for over an hour because i'm taking blood thinners within two weeks it's closed up you don't even see a scar i had abdominal surgery on january 30th okay and i i it's a it was a hernia an, an umbilical hernia which fat people tend to get. Anyway, I had done. I had looked at people's videos about it. And they said, oh, worst pain in my life, just all this stuff. It was never more than a dull ache, and the pain was gone in a week. They gave me OxyContin, and I said, I don't want this. And they said, well, you have, you, you're going to take it. And I said, no. I said, um, I, first off, I've been in pain so much in my life, I have a pretty, pretty high tolerance for it. Secondly, I'm not going to have that much pain. So it's still sitting here. I asked them if they wanted it back, and they said, no, that would be a felony if I was handing them back the pills, so I don't know what I'm going to do with them. But, uh, yeah. No, the autophagy, I'm convinced that's what healed my heart. I mean, I'm perfectly willing to give carnivore the, the, the uh, uh, kidney disease and the um, diabetes and all these other things because other people reported that. I've never seen anybody report the kind of damage reversal that I got in my heart. So I'm crediting the autophagy for that. And I really think that makes a big difference. Now, yes, it is also for the weight loss because carnivore doesn't, I don't lose weight on carnivore. I don't care if I try, I, I play with the macros. I've tried lion. I've tried, you know, um, more fat, less fat, more protein, less protein, eat more food at a time, eat less food at a time. I had three months to play with it. None of it worked. I didn't lose any weight. Well, actually, one week I lost three pounds, but it came right back. So, it's, so that's it, the fasting. I'm a big follower of Jason Fung. There's a German Institute of Fasting that I like to pay attention to. And I have noticed that lately you have had several guests discussing fasting. Uh, the, the, the lady, the professor from uh, Stanford. Talked about it. You had another fellow talking about it. Um, I really think the fasting is a big deal. You know, we go back thousands of years, and this was part of a healing regimen for, for human beings going back that far. Now, they may have been ignorant, but they weren't stupid. So they noticed something. And it works for me. I know that when my if my body fat gets below 10%, I read that your body does not react well to fasting. And I'd probably have to stop it at that point or just do a couple of days. But until I get to that stage, and people say to me, well, what way are you, what, what's your goal? I say, how the hell would I know? I weighed 230 when I graduated from high school. I don't know what a normal weight is for me. I it could be 160. It could be 180. My genius PCP said, don't you drop below 200 because I want you to have fat on you if you have to go in the hospital. Yeah, okay, lady. I'll pay as much attention to that as I do as your statin nonsense. Now, I don't want to be unfair. She is a nice lady. And if I want if I want tests, she'll go, well, even if she doesn't understand the test, she'll, she'll order the tests and stuff. So she's not a bad doctor. She's just a normally, regularly trained doctor. And I will say this. People have been oversold on their faith in doctors. 
I worked in a number of different clinics in dialysis for 26 years, which means I was exposed to a lot of nephrologists. And about one third of them are any good. The rest are lazy, bored, just basically a neglectful and criminal, um, and they don't care. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a doctor who's still practicing. And in dialysis, they like to put you on peritoneal where they use your stomach lining for the first to start and just have you dialyze at home and come in once a month for labs. Because when they start putting the shunts in your arms and legs, you only have a limited time. All those go bad in time and you, and you, and you have a limited time to live. So what this does, this can extend your life by as much as eight years. Because if you're careful with it and don't have a problem, the peritoneal dialysis can last that long. This doctor would not put any of his patients on peritoneal because he just didn't like it. So essentially, he was cutting six to eight years off of every one of his life of every one of his patients because he just couldn't be bothered. But he was considered a good doctor because, and here we go with the administrators running everything, he brought in a lot of patients, which means he brought in a lot of money. So no one would do anything about it. When people get get toward the end of their their situation and get really sick they spent a lot of time in the acutes in the icus and we would have we had a division that did nothing but dialyze people in the icus this doctor they would call him and say doctor you haven't put any orders in for your patient they're they're due you know and these people very fragile their their health was all over the place he'd go ah well just do what you did last time See, nobody ever dies of dialysis, so if they do something stupid like that and the patient dies, well, they were sick anyway. Nobody ever, paid, nobody ever looks into it. That's awful. Well, this is why I do it and why so many people do it. Taking care of your own health, you can't trust the doctors. It's not just that they've been trained or they're in a situation where they have no choice but just to pump pills and, not, and see you for five minutes. A lot of them just aren't any good. And the ones, it's like any con man. You know, people believe Jim Jones too. And they drank all that Kool-Aid. You know, um, they, they sell a good story. And you don't, if you don't pay any attention, you don't know. The only way for you to be safe is to take care of yourself. And that's what's great about all the carnivore, low carb, autophagy, all that stuff is your body can heal itself if you let it. As a matter of fact, the cells that get replaced under autophagy end up having longer telomeres, which means that if you believe the extended life people, they're actually going to last longer than the cells they replaced. Is it true? I don't know. I'm not selling it. I I had a woman tell me, uh, the, actually the, the nurse practitioner who saw me for cardiology said to me, you don't look 73. And I said, well, I would disagree. I said, I look 73. Like my mother's father looked at 73. Like so many people were eating, uh, you know, they, my, my mother's parents were farmers and they, up till, you know, Way into he up in way into his nineties, he had a garden every year. He would go fishing and eat the fish he caught, you know, all that stuff. Um, and he was a healthy man until his very late nineties. So that's where I think I'm at. I am a what should be a normal seventy-three year old. But most you you know, and I walk around in the store and look at the people who are around my age, and they can't walk. And their their shopping carts are full of all that poison, and they act sick. And you know how many pills are taken, and it's so unnecessary. Yeah, it's just, a society we've become so used to seeing everyone popping so many pills that everyone thinks that's just the normal way to live now, right? And it's criminal, and it's what we've been sold. Uh -huh. You know, it's just like Pfizer has bought two companies in the last year at extremely high prices. One is 
a, a company that specializes in dealing with myocarditis. And one is a company that specializes in this, uh, what they call, they're calling now explosive cancers. Well, gee, why would you think they would be investing in those? Yeah. It's just like it's, this. It's just, it's, so it's just like, like this Ozempic and all of the, what they're called, AG1 suppressors or something. I don't remember what they're called. Agonists. Anyway, um, the company that, that makes the stuff is in Europe, but they're not allowed to sell it in Europe. But their stock's just shooting through the roof because you have doctors now trying to put kids on that. It paralyzes your stomach. It has an incredible number of side effects. I was watching an interview with a lady last week who was going blind from it. And she's quit the, she's quit the medication, but her doctor said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Your sight will fade away until you're blind. This is, uh, I mean, I, I feel very much like this is a, they're just, okay, this is popular now. Let's get, let's sell as much as we can of this. Well, and we know there are going to be lawsuits, but we'll just deal with it when it happens. And I was watching a couple guys who were looking at all the side effects and they said, you know, in 10 years, the, the biggest money maker in the legal profession is going to be suing people over these drugs because that's how bad they are. But, you know, when you've told people you can't lose weight and the solutions you've always been given don't work, or they do work, but they're very short term, um, you eventually become, you, that when they tell you, well, Nothing, nothing will ever, your, your, your weight is permanent unless we give you this drug and then you have to stay on the drug the rest of your life. Well, of course, people are going to believe it. It's criminal behavior, in my opinion. But, you know, if, if you're a criminal and no one's going to prosecute you and no one's going to do anything about it, what difference does it make? So, um, James, where do things go for you from here? Um, I just, I the... just keep going. Mm. I just keep going. I would like, very much like, as a personal goal to get below two hundred pounds. That's a that would be a very big deal to me, because I haven't been there for fifty years. In the early seventies, I got down to one ninety five for a minute. So that would be feel like an accomplishment. But truthfully, um, uh, my ex girlfriend took a picture of me wearing. Uh, my shirt and jeans, which I haven't worn in many, many years, and I'm wearing now, um, and uh, sent it to my relatives, and then um, I sent it to some of the people I used to work with, and all that, and they're all just totally amazed at how I look. So you know, I you and I don't know if you were fat enough to experience this, Dave. I know you were were heavier, but it took me a long time to look in the mirror and see myself as having lost weight, even though my clothes were looser and I was wearing you know, smaller clothes and all that. When I looked in the mirror after I got a shower, I would still see that 300 and some odd pound guy. Took a long time to get over that. So getting this positive reinforcement is good for me. Um, and I have, and it's been good for the uh, uh, one thrift store that I donate to too. Because they've gotten a lot of new clothes that I bought, and I bought a bunch when I was losing weight, and then I lost weight down past where they would fit anymore, so I just gave them away. And I bought some clothes recently that I can't quite fit yet, but I will. And that's always a good problem to have when you've got to buy new clothes, right? Well, it's a psychologically uplifting issue, shall we say. But yeah, I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm happy with it. I'm like I said, my friend said they'd never heard me refer to myself as happy, and sometimes I do that now. You know, I've always seen the black and everything, and I'm not quite that way that that much that way anymore. Still, that's always going to be there. You know, I suffered too much damage to 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 ever be an optimist and to be a gregarious and, you know, not be a complete introvert, but I'm better. And, you know, the question you usually ask about this time is what would I tell other people? And the first thing I would say 
is you have to have an important reason. You know, there's a guy on the internet who's kind of a prepper guy I follow. He and his wife went on the carnivore diet because he needs to lose about 50 pounds. And then he'll go back to eating out of his garden. And I just wrote to him and said, if you do, just don't even bother. Don't even bother. If you got overweight eating the way you were eating, and you're going to lose weight, and you've got that mindset to where you're going to go on a diet, lose weight, and then it's going to magically cure the effect that other food had on you. Don't bother. You're wasting your time. My why is I was dying. I wanted to die. I didn't want to live anymore. I just I couldn't stand to be the way I was. I'm not that way anymore. I look forward to the day. I look forward to doing things. That's why I can do projects around the house now and stuff. I can't see myself consciously stopping. And as long as I'm not doing standard American diet or keto or any of that stuff, I'm not going to do it because as long as I stay on carnivore, I'm not, you know, that was the thing, the most important thing I learned for the three months I eat carnivore every day. I didn't lose weight, but I didn't gain any weight for three months. I've never done that before. Anytime I've hit a stall, my weight starts going, you know, like the, like we're headed for the new moon landing. And it didn't do that. So, again, gives you hope. Gives you the reward to keep going. And this is for me. My physical issues are for me. And you know what's silly? I can talk all day about, well, my, um, my heart healed and my diabetes went away and all this. People, yeah, okay, you know. And then I say, and look. The age spots have faded off the backs of my hands. Really? <laughs> it's like the most trivial crap in the world. I once heard a quote from a guy who was a, a stage performer, uh, sort of like in the Cirque du Soleil or whatever. And he said, and they asked him how, you know, people appreciate what he does. And he said, they don't have a clue. He said, the stuff that is nothing for us to do, they think is really spectacular. But the stuff that's really hard, it doesn't look like that much. And they never notice. Same deal. You know, I could tell them all my all my joint pain away, my arthritis is gone, all this stuff. You know, and oh yeah, okay. But I got a picture for them. But you know, a lot of that stuff you just don't notice in one day. You know, uh, it was the same with the floaters in my eyes. I always had bad floaters in my eyes. And I was wa watching a video, and somebody in their comments has said, "Yeah," and the floaters in my eyes faded away. And I said, "Oh." And so I looked real hard at the screen. No more floaters. God damn. Same thing with the spot, eight spots in my hands. I never noticed. And some lady had written in and said, yeah, the eight spots faded away. I don't even. And I said, you know, they just went away. I that you can. Now, if you look really close, you can see a little bit of indication where they were. But as far as the big dark spots, they're all gone. But I, you don't notice. Yeah. It's the same way. One day I realized, hey, my gums don't bleed all the time. Yeah, you know, um, the those things kind of creep up on you, but yeah, yeah. it's a, I agree, it's the little thing that suddenly, you know, when you mention them, that that's the impressive stuff, right? <laughs> and my hope is that as I continue with this way of eating, the living, and that as I continue, um, with the autophagy, that the improvements won't stop. That there's gonna be there's more things in my future that'll be positive that I don't know about yet. Um, James, if if people want to reach out to you, do you have a way that they can contact you, social media or anything? No, no. Here's what I will do though. Once this gets picked put up, uh, I will keep an eye on the comments for a week or so, because I've that's the way I communicate is I read people's comments and I'll write back to them in comments. James. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate your time. Well, I hope my my reason for doing it, you know, we've talked. My reason for doing it is I hope that it helps someone. And that's why I was willing to do it. So thank you very and thank much. You, and thank you for all you do, Dave. You know, other people have told you the same thing. In many ways, this is the most important channel on YouTube because. 
It's great to listen to Ken Berry. It's great to listen to Anthony Chafee. But it's easy to write those guys off or Sean Baker as anomalous. You come up with stories of people who are ordinary, everyday people, but they have a story. And they, and they have a, a way of living that saved them, that improved them. And they're the kind of people where a lot of people are going to go, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Mm. And that's why it's important because we need to get people to get over the hump of starting. That's what the big, you know, that's the hard thing is starting this, believing it and starting it. And that's, that's where your things come in. That's, that's important. 